thanks for coming to my talk. Uh, I, it's a really nice opportunity to uh, come to the Embedded Linux conference. This is my sec second time talking here. Um, I came to the Embedded Linux conference for half a dozen years uh, in the early 2000s when I was building embedded Linux products. And I have to say, it uh, was such a helpful uh, conference. And so I'm, you know, I feel like every year we travel around the sun, we come back to the same spot, and Tim Bird is still here, welcoming us back and, and doing the uh, uh, embedded Linux uh, conference. It's been going for a long time. And I got a lot of good advice here. Um, yesterday, a colleague that I worked with on a distributed real-time embedded audio uh, system r reminded me that we actually um, did the audio system in this room. And there's a, um, a little controller back there that we made. So like all embedded um, products, it is unlocked or has the default password. So if you want to go back and rickroll me, you could probably plug in and, <laughs> and uh, play some music for us. But uh, um, definitely, you get a lot of great advice here. And um, it's great to see um, Lucas Rusak here. He, last year, um, I talked a little bit about why and how you would want to use open source graphics drivers in embedded products. And we talked with him about if you don't need compositing, bring up a, um, just, just bring up a, a full screen rendering context and, um, uh, with like a, in KMS. And he works with the Kodi Linux project and um, went and did that. And it simplified a lot of things for him. And I saw him at FOSDEM where he presented on, on what a great simplification it was for their multi-platform you know, uh, media solution, um, which is used by just tons and tons of users. So. Um, it's, it's great. I mean, the, the advice you get here, here is real. So um, hopefully I can um, give you guys some, some good advice. So like I said, I've been working on Linux for well over 10 years. Um, and uh, just on graphics for the past five years or so, um, I, I worked on the graphics performance analyzers team um, starting around 2011 to help them address and target Android. And so. My former uh, technical lead is, is here as well. And um, I'm terrified because of all the people. He can totally destroy my talk um, with some tough questions. Um, and to give him credit, in fact, everything I've done has really been um, along the lines of the product that he um, envisioned and, and created. And so um, his, his work, I think, really has enabled Linux uh, Intel graphics in a way that most people can't say. Um, they, they helped any, any product, so he's really a critical person. And hopefully I, I haven't, uh, haven't done wrong, but um, we'll, we'll see what he thinks of, of uh, my demo. So uh, I've been working on Mesa for several years. Um, Mesa is a very successful open source driver um, for uh, 3D graphics, used by millions and millions of people. I mean. 10% of the market in China pre-ships with, with Mesa as their graphic solution. So um, uh, it, it's, it's big numbers. We get a lot of users. And I've been working on this performance tool, um, but more on um, automating the developer process for the, for the team, which has been very helpful as well for them. OK, so um, just before we start, um, my tool is really focused on um, sort of deeply investigating performance problems in uh, a frame that you're rendering with the GPU. Um, you really don't want to go and investigate at that level until you're confident that that's where your bottleneck is. So um, all of the graphics rendering um, happens with two sort of asynchronous processors where the CPU will enqueue a whole bunch of work for the GPU to then consume. And so if your CPU cannot produce the work for the GPU fast enough, then your GPU will be idle. And there's no sense in going and looking at your GPU performance. You need to go and use the standard tools on the, on the CPU side to, to fix your CPU bottlenecks. Um, uh, but then if you are bottlenecked on the GPU, that's, that's when you want to go use a tool like um, Frame Retrace. So you can use Top to see you know, what, your, what your CPU utilization is. There's a new tool called GPU Top that um, uh, OTC has been making that works on, on Linux. And there's similar tools for every single graphics um, card out there that'll tell you how busy is the GPU. 
Rappel is a tool that'll tell you um, where your power is going. So typically with embedded processors, you might, be, you might have a thermal budget and um, the BIOS have turned down your clocks if you use too much power. So you need to look at Rappel. You might have 100% GPU utilization, but in fact your clocks are running at half speed because um, your, your chip can't support that, that amount of load. So um, yeah, so you go look in the GPU side. If you have 100% GPU utilization and your CPU utilization is low, um, you could probably do some simpler things like just set Mesa debug equals perf and it'll output a whole ton of um, advice for you when you've made sort of bad rendering decisions. Um, um, yeah, so we all know how to optimize performance problems on the CPU. I think the tools here are fantastic. They're one of the reasons why embedded Linux is successful um, and Linux as a whole is because it's so wonderful to be a developer on the Linux platform. Uh, but on the GPU side, uh, you, you have a completely different story. Um, typically, you have uh, vendor-specific um, GPU analysis tools that they've made to help their um, developers target their platform. And they're, they're not interested at all in enabling another uh, vendor for um, improving performance. And in fact, they'll, they'll often try to disrupt each other. Like you might see one uh, large GPU vendor provide a free tool that helps you, you know, generate a, uh, a scene and it does all of this uh, metaprogramming for you. But in fact, what it's doing is injecting hundreds of millions of vertices into what's a flat wall because they know that their competition can't deal with a whole lot of vertices, right? So um, when you go and you want to improve performance for your GPU workload, you're kind of dealing with tools that are kind of more in the interest of the, of the vendor sometimes. Um, so QAPI Trace is a open source uh, multi-platform tool um, that you can use to go and invest in, uh, investigate and debug um, a frame. So that's an exception. Another great exception is RenderDoc. Valve has really been investing heavily in um, supporting RenderDoc. And um, really because of their investment, I think a whole lot of um, uh, GPU vendors are, are forced to go and, and, and participate in that, in that tool as well. They all do the same thing, though. Um, if they're perform performance analyzers, they'll leverage the hardware counters on the GPU to help you understand the cost of the asynchronous work that you're enqueuing for the GPU. Without that, you really have no hope of understanding why your, your workload is slow, because all you get is frame rate. Um, uh, they, they will often have other features, like give you some live experimentation so you can twiddle around with the workload and try to figure out, okay, well, how do, how do I fix this performance bottleneck? But generally, they'll let you dive right down into the deep details of a, a graphics workload. So um, the real problems with most of the tools is, like I said, they're hardware specific. Um, really, most of them are coming from a Windows um, background because, you know, to be frank, that's where 3D is. It's um, all of these high-end AAA titles are running on Windows. That's what the vendors want to support. Um, and Linux is really an afterthought. Um, so maybe you'll get um, a uh, silicon vendor to go and port part of their tool to Linux. But really, they might port just the collection side. And so you'll still need a Windows host to run a forms-based UI to go and, and um, instrument your, your embedded target. Um, but another thing that can happen with them is, I mean, they're in, in DX, I think the tracing and retracing is um, perhaps easier. Um, when you get into OpenGL, especially above OpenGL ES, there's a ton of extensions that can be optionally supported. And so if you have the task of understanding the state of the GPU and you want to retrace it, you might be using extensions that are not I mean, it works on NVIDIA, for example, and you can get the, the tool working on NVIDIA, but if you go to AMD, then the tracing breaks um, horribly because those extensions are not available for querying the state. And that happened to a tool called Vogel that um, you know, Valve, I think, was also working on, and, and it struggled because of the tracing support. Uh, the other thing is that, um, frankly, there's just low numbers of users. Um, I think graphics programming is a niche within computer science. Uh, but Linux graphics programming is a micro niche. You know, you guys, if you're programming graphics on Linux platforms, you are the exotic few who um, are so intriguing. Um, my, my, my six users, you know. Um, actually, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I think it's going to be growing. Um, the fact that the Google Play Store is coming to, to Linux platforms on Chrome OS, 
that just means you have hundreds of thousands of 3D titles that are going to be running on Linux. Um, you know, for the first time, there's a stable API, ABI where um, commercial vendors can go and write um, applications and charge for them and have them running on a Linux platform. So, Another reason why um, these tools haven't worked on Linux is because the counters haven't been there. We really haven't um, been enabled until recently to expose this information for whatever reason, um, and that's been true for other vendors as well, but um, Radeon is now exposing GPU performance counters in, in Mesa, and so is Intel, so um, that's what enables this work. So I have um, written a tool I'm calling Frame Retrace. It's based on API Trace, which is perhaps the most widely used um, OpenGL debugging tool out there. Um, it has uh, really high quality um, retracing, and it's used by tons of vendors. It was written by VMware. They use it all the time to verify their DX to GL um, translation when they're running a Windows guest on a Linux host. And um, for that reason, it's, it's a really healthy project. It typically, like, for example, Valve might find that Day of the Ancients does not trace and retrace properly. And, and because of that, they cannot debug their own application. So they'll um, enhance API trace, or they'll enhance their own application to enable that. API trace is cross-platform. Like I said, Valve, uh, VMware is using it for Windows analysis. And um, because it's cross-platform, that means that my tool also is cross-platform. And that's a, um, a huge benefit to driver developers, particularly. Um, it's hardware agnostic. Um, it's, it was written for Intel because that's what um, that's where I work. Um, Intel is now shipping AMD GPUs on package um, in the in the Kaby Lake G um, processor, and so um, AMD has kind of been enabling uh, Frame Retrace to work on their hardware, and that allows us to go and analyze that platform. There are other platforms. Um, I, you know, I, I gave a similar talk at um, the X Developers Conference in the fall, and um, other um, Mesa driver trees are, are adding support so that they can instrument their driver in this tool as well. It's already been used uh, by the Mesa team pretty heavily to go and find gaps in our driver um, for reasons uh, in the demo. Maybe I'll explain exactly why it's so easy to use this tool to find gaps in the driver. Um, so it's effective, it's in use. Um, so here's a list of some of the features that we have in the tool. I'm not going to go through them because really um, the demo will, will go through them. But if you know people are looking online, they can see this in the, in the um, notes. All right, so let's switch to a demo. Um, um, all right, I should have done this before. All right. So let's open a file, and I think we want. So um, this opens a file. You can specify the host that you want to connect to. If you're working on an embedded platform, you typically don't want to render the graphics for the tool actually on the, on the local host. You'll want to connect to it. This is a really crusty old um, benchmark, which unfortunately people still pay attention to, but because it's old, um, it's been hacked in tons of ways, and there's plenty of performance problems to look at. So I will um, show you uh, some of those. OK, so um, just a shout out to my former tech lead. He, he will recognize this UI immediately because I totally stole it from his very successful product. Um, and um, I, I hope it's an homage to him. So uh, here, are the, here are some of the metrics that we support. As you can see, there's just tons of metrics. It's almost too many to look at. Um, uh, typically, um, you'll just want to filter down. So if you want to know how much things cost, you graph the number of clocks there. And so um, you can see right away that this is the most expensive render. Um, so the render target will show you the render at each draw. So if you um, select, say, some renders here, and you highlight them, it will tell you what those renders are coloring. Um, you might stop at the render to you know, iterate through the frame and see how it's being composed with each draw. 
um, or clear before render just to see the pixels that that specific render is touching, right? So this helps you figure out um, exactly what's going on in the frame uh, just by looking around. Um, there's API calls. I mean, it's pretty standard stuff, but like if you were looking for clear calls, you might type in, you know, clear. And so these are the these are the renders that are calling, you know, clear. Um, this this I think. The UI could use some work. It'd be nice to have different colors for the bars if they're clear so you can really see them easily. Um, some other nice features. Um, so for every render, um, I capture the batch disassembly. That's the, um, the actual binary instructions that are sent down to the GPU. Um, and um, I don't think this feature is really available in any other driver where you can instantly go and get a dump of all the information so for driver developers, there's a lot of features that need to be added to this tool, but for driver developers, they can find anything they need to understand um, the details of, of a specific draw call, whether it's using one texture format or another. Um, in the shader view, um, we will capture the vertex and the fragment um, shader, but we also display the intermediate representation and the sing static single assignment form, and then the um, SIMD8 or SIMD8-16 uh, binary um, compiled shader that's sent down to the GPU. So that can be helpful for driver developers or compiler developers who want to understand why they're, um, why this shader has compiled in a certain way and is slow. Um, what else can I show you? Um, we should see the, um, the metrics. So as I said, there's tons of metrics and um, they have longer descriptions that you can look at if you don't really know what a, DS stall is, you can see that it's domain shaders. That's not really something um, for the T-Rex the demo, but there's tons of, them, tons of them, and if you're looking at a specific render or a set of renders, it'll tell you what the cost is of that selection relative to the rest of the frame. So this is a, a pretty helpful way for you to quickly narrow down what's expensive, how expensive is it, and um, then you can proceed to go and experiment. So. Um, for example, this expensive shader, if you wanted to replace it with a simple shader, um, let's look at the shader real quickly. So the vertex shader is nothing because um, in fact, you can tell it's just drawing two triangles to um, present a rec to the screen. But um, the fragment shader is um, a little bit more complicated. If you replace it with a simple shader, um, the shader just turns to draw the pixel pink. That's about as simple as you can get. And the render target is now completely pink. Um, the metrics will show that the cost is much cheaper. Not that cheap, though. It's a lot of pixels. So um, yeah, so that's the way the experiments. Or you can disable the draw completely and, and um, see what the overall frame rate would be if you weren't doing that draw. All right, so the reason I picked this is because um, this particular shader has an expensive motion blur effect. And um, if you look at the render, so here's the render target. If you look at the renders before that, what you'll see is um, kind of a ugly green screen. And what that's doing, it's, it's kind of changing the pixel value based on how fast the object's moving in, in the render. And then in the final shader, it'll sample from those pixels. And based on the value, it will figure out how much it wants to kind of swizzle the, the texture state a little bit to make a blur effect. So um, the problem with that is um, if you looked at that texture, it was mostly zero. Um, it mostly is not moving. Um, and what this shader does is, sorry, let me get the right shader. What this shader does is it will, for every pixel, cut it down by 25% and then sample from the, the adjacent, adjacent pixels um, depending on what that value is. So um, there's a really simple hack um, that you can do, which is I'll just paste in another shader. So um, you can edit this. So if I type something in and compile, it'll give me a syntax error. Um, but if you select it all and paste in a completely new shader, um, what this will do is if the motion value is zero, don't bother sampling four times from exactly the same value and then adding them together to get the same number that you would have gotten, just sample once. So watch the cost of this render when I compile it. It goes down by you know 30%. So that's enough for like 
seven or eight percent for this whole benchmark to change that one shader. So um, this is not something that we can put in Mesa because it's an optimization designed specifically to alter the score of a benchmark to make our hardware look like it can process this bad shader. But if you have a proprietary driver from a vendor who's giving you a large 40 megabyte binary blob, you have to ask yourself what's in that blob. Um, and probably what's in it is a lot of shaders for benchmarks that they've rewritten the shaders to try to give, you know, if I happen to be running, you know, benchmark X, don't do what it says, let's do it the right way. Like, let's avoid our own glass jaw and, and rewrite the shader completely. So, um, like I said, lots of dirty tricks that you can, you can play with a proprietary driver stack. All right. Um, in fact, if you look at the render target, it is exactly, it's pixel the same, right? It's equivalent. Um, we did have a bug when we went and um, tried to implement this. We weren't getting the performance benefit, and it turned out we did our math wrong. And so, it, you know, just an example of how you can experiment quickly if you say, okay, well, let's just make those pixels black for if I'm in this if case, and you hit compile and you look at the render target. And it's actually interesting. I wouldn't have, from the green render target, I wouldn't have noticed that the waterfall was also moving slightly, um, but um, you, can, you can quickly change the shader, recompile, and re-render, see the performance difference, and, and try to find the bugs in your shader. So this is a performance tool, but it's, I think, even more so a shader debugger tool, and that's really what's missing in the Linux graphics space. All right, I think that's enough for, just make sure I've Okay, so let's, let's go on quickly to a more complicated demo um, because that workload is not that interesting. Um, so for this one, I'm gonna um, disable, I'm gonna enable the shader cache. We have a new transparent shader cache in Mesa which makes things much faster and that's lovely for all of our users. Unfortunately, when you're not compiling the shaders, this tool can't um, collect all the intermediate assembly and um, give you the um, the binary, the SIMD16. So um, we wouldn't, we'd still be waiting right now if, if I, I didn't have the shader cache enabled. Um, so those of you who are writing Mesa Master, I think that's it's good for you. The shader cache is there for you, and I think it will stop your games from jittering as you enter the room where new things are rendered. Um, Okay, so this is um, Aztec Ruins. It's the, um, I think it's the newest GFX bench um, uh, benchmark that people are working towards. But again, you can see in the profile that the performance is totally dominated by a few um, renders, um, specifically this one. And in fact, um, if you, <laughs> it's always the, it's always the compose, compose the final frame. Um, what's this frame doing? I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. Um, if you look at the renders leading up to it, what you'll see is um, different blurry, <laughs> blurriness, right? So it's, it's rendering the same thing over and over again with different blur effects. And then in this frame, it's, it's um, composing them completely. You can see maybe in the back here, there's a little thing that's far off. And um, if you look at the previous one, it should just clear up a little bit. So it gets clear. It's a depth of field effect, right? So it's trying to make it look like a camera's focused. Um, still expensive. If you look at the render, you'll see um, that, oh, sorry, vertex shader is nothing, but in the, in the fragment shader, um, it, it appears that GFX Bench has noticed that, um, that everyone is replacing their shader and making it more efficient, because in this case, they actually do check to see if there's anything, and it's only in the else case where they iterate through and, and go and sample for the, for the blur effect. Um, so that's, that's good. Um, I really wanna um, look at this frame though more to show you some of the other debugging um, features. Um, well, there's experiments. I mean, it's interesting if you disable this and look at the render target, it's, it's the same. So, um, but there's also a memory or barrier. I mean, you know, I think if you're um, the author of the program or a real expert in GL, you can, you know, kind of read into this stuff and, and, and dissect the program. There's similar tools for DX, and actually it's pretty interesting online to go see someone go dissect Grand Theft Auto and tell you how all the shaders work and, and what they're doing. Um, 
So it's a great way. This tool is a great way to learn OpenGL um, and other shader debugger tools are, are great for learning DX, whatever. So. All right, so I didn't show you uniforms. Um, these are the constants that are attached to every program that parameterize the execution. So typically they might rotate a triangle in space and put it in the right spot for rendering. Um, before I do this, I want to locate the character in the screen. So um, uh, let's see. So let's, let's look at the uh, number of triangles, and that'll kind of give us a hint where there's lots of triangles going on. Um, OK, so that's her face. Um, I didn't show you the multiple render targets. So um, typically, more complicated applications will render to more than one um, render target, at, or sorry, more than one frame buffer at a time, and then use those later in the frame to compose things. So it's kind of interesting to see that. Um, but let's zoom in on this. This is, OK, so let's go back here. One more. OK, so this is the character. Um, and if you look at the uniforms, um, so here's the projection. And if I change a value um, and hit return, it should re-execute. Oh, you can see, um, actually, her, her head has kind of been moved over to the side, right? Because I've changed, changed where those triangles are, are um, transformed. And, um, it's kind of eerie. Her eyes are still in place, which is a little creepy. But <laughs> so, you know, some like the eyes there. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So if you have a problem with uniforms and you, you're uh, writing your game, you can go and figure out what they're doing, or you, you know, change them, find your bugs. Um, so we'll put put her head back on. And um, but there's um, so yeah, that's uniforms. And um, the other thing I've been adding is entries for the GL state. So um, this is not a complete collection of GL state, but it's what I've, what I've been able to add so far. Um, I kind of wrote my own Q, QML hierarchical um, tree um, thing. And so the problem with like putting things in folders is like you can never find what you're looking for. So if you're looking for something like the scissor state, you can um, just filter um, to to find what you're looking for. But for example, um, some state has you know, multiple red, blue, red, green, blue, alpha. Some has like near, far. Um, all of the sort of indices for the state are, are correctly displayed. And if you have um, an enum, uh, the, um, the correct values are offered to you um, for, for selection. And you can, you can change those. And um, yeah, so if we go down and look for what am I thinking for? Uh, yeah, like the right mask. Um, so if red is enabled, that means that when you're rendering a red pixel, the red channel is written. And if you disable it, that means the red pixels are not going to be written. It's going to keep whatever red value it had before. And so go back, look at the render target, and the character is kind of see-through because the red in her um, frame has not been written. It's got the same value it had before. So there's a, an example of, of, of that. Um, you can go and culling is another thing. So culling is on, and it's culling the back face of triangles. So in a model, there's a bunch of triangles. If she turns around, a bunch of triangles are facing the opposite direction. And you don't need to run the shader on those triangles because they're, they're facing away. So it culls the back face. If you cull the front face, um, and go back to the render target. It's just kind of turned her around, except for her eyes, which is also a little creepy. But um, she's she's decided that it's too dangerous to go after the gem, and she's uh, you know going to turn around and, and walk out. So um, yeah, so you can change any of the state, and I think it's pretty easy to add new state items. You just kind of look through the GL spec and collect it, and then overwrite it when you're when you're retracing it. Um, if you go to the end, it's interesting. Her um, she hasn't turned around in the final frame, but that, that, that turns out to be because if you remember, we turned this shader off with the GL memory barrier. And if I turn it back on in the, in the render target, she's um, rendered around. So you can hack this stuff. Um, yeah, so I think there's anything else I wanted to see. Um, um, yeah, we can do scissor state. Ah, forget about it. We, let's, let's move on um, in the interest of time. <laughs> 
OK. So um, I want to show you a really uh, complex uh, frame. Not a, not a benchmark, not something simplified just to exercise your GPU, but an actual Unreal demo. And um, let me see what uh, frame 29. So um, this is like OpenGL 4.4, I think. And um, it's not the fastest thing. It's, it's um, intended to provide a lot of photorealistic effects. Uh, this is the kind of thing that a lot of retracing, these are the, these are the workloads that they're going to fall over on. So if you don't have a tool like KPX that's built on top of, um, and you're Unreal, it's, you're going to want to go look at this complicated workload. It's not going to work. Um, so um, it takes a little while for it to iterate over the frame to give you all the metrics. But. So um, again, you're going to see dominated by a few, um, a few uh, bars. So this is this is where the where the time is going. And if you um, want to go and give it a second, here we go. So if you want to go and and look at the the shaders, you'll, what you'll see is there's actually not a um, fragment shader or a vertex shader. It's a it's a compute shader, and um, the reason why it's expensive is like it's a it's a pretty I don't, do you guys have like limitations on how far you can indent code when you're when you're when you're contributing? Because uh, yeah, this one is a monster, right? Uh, like so, so that's why it's expensive. Um, uh, I think the um, other one is the last one. This is not a compute shader, but actually it's just one call and it's flush. So again, if you want to go and, and find the performance bottlenecks, you you simply cannot look at the frame rate, right? You really have to know and understand what's going on in the frame and, and experiment and, and get that feedback. Uh, if you have a flush, it might mean that you've got two different threads that are ping-ponging back and forth. One's preparing the um, GL commands for one frame, and then the other one's going to do the other frame, and then they're going to be rendered in a single context. And so, um, so they're probably trying to work around underpowered CPUs, and I would recommend that they use Intel processors if that's a problem for them, because we have really powerful CPUs, and our GPUs, you know, are not as powerful, so you can get by pretty well. You don't need this kind of crazy programming technique. Um, uh, yeah. So if you go and let's disable these things, and kind of bring 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 up the other. There's not a lot of demos at ELC because it's risky, <laughs> but I'm living on the edge here. So, all right. Um, if we look in this range, what we'll see if we wait long enough is that this is sort of rendering the, the fight scene. And um, so, these are the renders that are kind of drawing out the actual geometry. And so this is another example of like when you want to, um, let's say, stop a render. So, so you can see it's kind of drawing the floor in the background, kind of moves, moves forward, starts drawing some of the stuff, and then eventually starts drawing the characters, the little neat weapons that they have on their, on their belt and their heads. Um, and so this is really an elementary, elementary uh, performance rendering mistake that um, is easy to do. And if you program GL, maybe you, you can recognize what's, what's costly or, or wrong about the way they're rendering the scene. Does anybody know? Um, they're rendering back to front, right? So when you, when you render back to front, um, you have to draw all the pixels. And then you're going to render the thing in front of it. It's going to draw all those pixels on top of the pixels you already drew. And um, GL has this thing. It's called the um, depth test. And they've got the depth test on. And if they had started at the front and um, drawn the characters and then drawn the wall behind them, most of the pictures in the wall would have not passed the depth test. It would have recognized that those triangles are further away. And then you wouldn't have had to go and execute the fragment shader. So it would have been faster. So interestingly, um, Overdraw, that's called overdraw. Um, that's, that's like the feature that um, Unreal was asking from, from this tool. It's like we want a, an overdraw representation so we can figure out like, okay, when are, when, are, when are we doing things in the wrong order? 
Yeah, okay, so I don't, I don't wanna spend too much time on this. The, the features are there, but it's just an example of a more complicated workload um, that you can go investigate and analyze and um, um, find mistakes as a, as a, driver, as a game developer. Um, let me see, is there anything else I wanna show? Okay, so um, things that um, maybe didn't, this demo did not show off. Um, I talked um, previously about the Windows support. This is uh, critical for the, for the driver team. If you can envision taking a single trace either on Windows or on Linux, playing it back on the, on the two platforms and, and having the exact same UI with the precise set of metrics that are exactly the same, um, you can easily find out where your driver stack is, um, has a gap or, um, or your, your other driver stack has a gap. And so the cross-platform nature and multi-platform nature is gonna enable a lot of sort of competitive analysis um, of these workloads. Um, but yeah, for Mesa developers, we can both you know, kind of make recommendations to the Windows driver, like, hey, there's this optimization you're missing, or um, we can find that, hey, we totally, totally missed this feature in, in our hardware enabling, and that's why we're slow on a certain platform. So it's been the key to, to finding and fixing problems in our driver. Things that I need to add, um, which um, really I'm taking as a template, the uh, um, Graphics Performance Analyzers tool, which I think is just a fantastic product that, um, that Matt made. Um, but um, displaying and experimenting with the texture state, um, displaying the geometry mesh so that people can see the vertices and understand um, what, what each draw is drawing. Depth buffer visualization. Um, you can mess with the depth state, but like actually seeing what, what the values are in the depth buffer is very helpful. And overdraw and hotspot. If you can look, think of the render target as something where the color rarely represents how expensive that each pixel was, that's, that's kind of the thing you need as a, as a game developer to figure out where to go look. Um, UI improvements, I'm not a, a QT, QML developer. This is my first sort of attempt, um, so I'm trying all the time to make it a little better. Um, but also adding support for more hardware and Android specifically. Um, you know, uh, API Trace dropped support for Android because it didn't seem like anyone was using it, but it's really the thing. Google has kind of signed up to re-enable Android support and API Trace, and that'll let, let um, people like Mesa developers or, or um, game developers go and figure out like how can they fix um, performance problems. Um, it's not a huge project right now, it's mostly me, but I have a bunch of people who've helped me, um, especially Robert Bragg and Lionel Landerwillen. Um, uh, they definitely have enabled the performance counters that this is all based on, and so um, that's great. And I'm actually gonna try to show um, Lionel's tool next as well, because that's pretty, pretty neat. Um, one problem is that when you replace a shader in a program, you have to recompile all the source, and you have to make a new program, and you have to attach every single thing to that program, all the constants and all the vertices. And so that can be kind of intricate. And um, you know, the workloads that, I, that I've, I've looked at, it works. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's gonna be a process of getting more and more users to, to um, use the tool and, and report things that I can fix. Uh, the other thing is not all the workloads have single frame run loops, so um, Dota 2 is like this, where the way they ping pong their threads back and forth, if you just choose a single frame and iterate over it, it won't render properly, and so um, that's another thing I need to fix. Um, yeah, so what's new is um, AMD Performance Monitor um, support, so uh, uh, engineers from AMD have um, helpfully implemented this, this interface and um, uh, getting it into frame retrace is, is pretty trivial. Um, but um, now we have a whole pile of metrics that'll help us um, go and look at the um, uh, Cabulate G. Um, unfortunately, one of the things about the way they implemented this, this extension, they, they, they didn't really do it as written. What they did is they exposed just the raw registers from their performance fabric. And so um, if you say, how many counters do you have? It'll be like, I have 50,000 counters. Um, and you need a third party tool to go and interpret that and turn it into real metrics. Um, they, luckily, they've open sourced that as well. It's called um, GPA, which is a little bit confusing um, for those of us who worked on the GPA team at Intel. Um, but um, since they put it on GitHub, it was um, you know, not too hard to go and, and, and uh, fix it. What I found out, though, um, when I went and tested that is that 
the, that GPA library that AMD makes has never ever run on Mesa. It's only run on the Catalyst driver uh, for Linux. So, um, you know, this is why we need open source tools because you can't depend on your upstream producers to solve all your problems for you. You need to be able to take their, their implementation, put it in your embedded product and figure out why it doesn't work and then go and, and fix it. Um, uh, it's really critical for everyone here. So um, that's what's happened with GPA. So it's, this is fresh out of the oven. It's, it, it'll burn your fingers. I mean, um, I'm, I think I'm the only person who, who's ever gotten um, AMD metrics off of Mesa. So if you run right now to my frame retrace branch and, and look for uh, a GPA branch next to it, um, you could be the second person in the world to, uh, to look at uh, Radeon metrics for a uh, graphics workload on Linux. Um, uh, as a side effect though, um, Raspberry Pi and Nouveau, they've both added support for the AMD performance monitor. So um, all those developers are eager to get the same support for their, um, for their platforms and, and those will be arriving soon. Okay, um, I have a little bit of time, so I want to um, talk a little bit. If you remember, I, I mentioned uh, you use GPU top to um, see the system load, and I, I'd like to show that for you. Um, so I just need to, um, since it's collecting metrics from the whole system, it needs to run a server as root, so you start GPU top and then start the GPU top UI. And um, Lionel has done a fantastic job of adding tons of features to this. Um, he, it used to be GPU top was kind of like a web JavaScript uh, thing you could connect and, and view in your web browser, but he decided that this rendering engine called IM GUI is like the coolest thing. He loves it and um, he's, it's amazing how fast he can get things done with it. So if you haven't seen IM GUI, Especially for the embedded world, it, it sounds like it's it sounds like it rocks. So um, I would I would take a look at that. Um, all right. So so if we connect to the server, you'd, again you'd want to run this on a different system because IM GUI has its own graphics, and that's going to cause GPU work to be um, uh, running on your on your system, but. Uh, my system is a Cavi Lake GT3, so there's three slices, each with eight EUs. Um, uh, so let's see if I can remember. So if we choose the render basic, that's kind of like the general metrics you want, and then we start sampling. Um, this is up top, it's just the CPU utilization, but if we show the um, Live counters, there it is. It'll give you a nice little, um, these are this, pretty much the same counters um, as API trace, as the frame retrace tool. You can choose a different counter set for different tools, but you can see whether the EU is active or stalled and how busy the GPU is. There's not a lot going on. Um, there's also a timeline. Uh, let's not do that. What is it? Um, oh, yeah, timeline. So. If you add, sorry about that, EU stall and EU active and GPU busy, um, it's kind of graphing it over time, and so I'll go and start a, a workload. Um, so um, again, this is our, our benchmark where she wants to go and get the gem. And um, you can see that, um, the GPU is much busier. Um, we actually have quite a bit of stall here, and so it seems to me that we have some opportunity to try to figure out on our hardware platform what exactly um, is stalling and, and try to optimize this, this workload quite a bit. Um, so you can see, oh, she's got the gem, but now there's gonna be bad things happen. So, uh, yeah. One other thing though, if you notice over on the CPU land, it, it, the, the CPU is pegged at 100%. So in fact, the GPU is not at 100%. And so this is a classic case of where you, you don't wanna go and optimize the, the workload too hard because it's not gonna improve your frame rate. It's just, it's just not gonna improve your frame rate uh, because that's not what's slowing you down. Um, so, this, 
you have to understand this is an API trace of the benchmark. It may be that running the benchmark itself is not GPU bound, but I just want to show you an example of, of why you need to look at the system uh, a little first. So, all right, so this is the part that's like really, um, yeah, interesting. So if we say, all right, um, this is what Lionel's working on now. It's really cool. Um, these are events that are happening. And so if you stop sampling, you can kind of zoom in and, and see um, what's going on in different rendering threads. So um, more to come here. I think this is really cool. If you're missing a vSync event and you're, you're stuttering because you can't get the graphics workload done in time, um, there's going to be events like when was the working queued? When did the context switch? Right? Um, when did was the last frame flipped? Um, and that will give you hints as to why you're missing that deadline. So, in order to actually show that, I need to run a, a kernel and um, I, a brand new kernel, which is not upstream. And I did not want to risk my my demo on that particular kernel. You know, it's it's still in the oven. It's not cooked, and I don't want the raw chicken to cause my my demo to puke all over. Um, but I think you guys get the idea that there's, there's a lot of features there and there's, there's going to be a lot of information for you to look at. All right. Um, that's, that's it. Those are the tools that we have. Um, and I hope you find that it's interesting or, you know, helps you think of things to look at with your driver stack. So, um, do you have any questions about the, the product? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, like um, before performance counter support, you click on the metric drop down. So the question is, is it just the performance counters that we need in order to make the tool run on other um, other platforms? And I mean, the bar graph is the most important part of that tool if you're looking at performance. Um, if you don't have performance counters, the number of metrics you get to um, graph is one, and it's called no metric, and it just is a, a flat bar graph. You can still use the debugging because OpenGL is OpenGL, and this intercepts at the OpenGL layer. Um, so I know that um, the um, Broadcom driver developer has fired it up to go look at, um, at, at workloads just for debugging. So, yeah. Anything else? All right. Well, um, thanks for your time. I hope it's interesting, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.